Today, we're gonna to be looking at employment development and job placement. So I don't know if a lot of people know, but with AVERTAC, we started a, a, a piloting project where we're really going in depth on four, um, four different components of job placement. This webinar is not part of that. This webinar is more of a, just kind of a down and dirty, how do you do job placement? What are some of the tips and techniques that we do with that? Uh, eventually, with the other project that we're doing, we're going to hopefully be able to produce some modules that your programs can use uh, to develop your infrastructure for the for the placement as we get going. So, the people that we're going to be working with today, um, I forgot to put one name on here, and I apologize. I asked Tom Cyrus to to join us because he's going to be providing us with some of the information on the remote aspects of, of placement. Um, he's, he was the former director in remote Alaska. So he has some really good insight on that. And the other two people that are going to be joining us today are Nancy and Tamara. And, um, when I get done rambling on, I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I don't want to talk for them. And, uh, and then we'll give Tom a chance to give us a little bit of background on him. So I apologize, Tom, for not having your name on this slide. Go ahead, Nancy. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce yourself. I will. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm Nancy Riddick. I'm with um, AvaTech as a content expert. I am completing my PhD. Um, last stretch of it is my dissertation, which, you know, I'm hammering that out, hopefully. In May, I'll be that full-fledged PhD person. And I'm going to still be Nancy. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm a part-time lecturer at UTRGV. That's University of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I also found and wrote the grant, and, and uh, I'm the project manager of a program I founded called Leadership Now. That's for undergraduate females working in our discipline um, of uh, vocational rehab counseling. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I'm an adjunct professor also at um, Northwest <laughs> Indian College, uh, the TBR Institute. And that's enough about me for right now. <laughs> you all, I see uh, some familiar faces in here. So I um, hope you all enjoy the program today or the video today, webinar. <laughs> Apple. <laughs> all right, Tamara. Good afternoon. My name is Tamara Patterson. I am with North Carolina Workforce Development. I um, have a lot of um, knowledge and experience in workforce development, education, and training. Um, I monitor the programs for Workforce Development Innovation and Opportunity Act here in North Carolina. We have 24 workforce development boards and each board has a contractor. So once they're using our services, we kind of go in and help with um, guidance and um, provision for uh, um, policy and procedures. And so I'm very familiar with the programs and um, how things work for with the workforce development and the um, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act programs. So I hope to share that with you today, some of it. Thank you. Tom, can you give a little bit of background on yourself, please? Sure. My name is uh, Tom Cyrus, and uh, I have been happily retired for almost two years. And uh, Winona has been emailing me and Facebooking me for the last couple of years, trying to get me to um, become a contact expert uh, for Avertech. And so this past January, I, I started with them. Um, I had been um, a program um, director for the Manilik Association for uh, 15 years in um, the Northwest Arctic region of Alaska. And so um, I guess my expertise would be in uh, developing, develop or uh, um, providing services in, in remote areas um, and working with traditional councils and, and local governments. Um, also, I've done a lot with uh, um, subsistence uh, uh, planning 
and using that as a, a viable employment outcome um, for the, the folks that live in the Northwest Arctic region. So that's it. Thank you, Tom. All right, so our objectives today, we wanna to distinguish the roles of the AVERS VR counselor, the VR tax and the AVERS employment specialist related to employment development and job placement. These these services um, a lot of, or these roles get meshed quite a bit, and we want to make sure that we're able to distinguish between the two of them. At what point do we start letting go of one set of roles when we take on another set to to help these people find employment? We want to learn about multiple approaches to employment development and placement. Um, the one and done never works. I mean that's <laughs> we I've never been able to just find one person a job with one one tool. There, there's always a, an umbrella of tools that these individuals um, fall under and we provide those services to help them maintain their employment once they get it. So we also want to assess the strategies for maximizing efficient use of resources. So as, as all of us know, VR is the payer of last resort. Um, we, we, have, we are required to utilize comparable benefits up front. And then when we, we cover the rest of it, um, that's not met through comparable benefits. And this is no different. This, this service, we have to look out, we have to reach out to other people to help us provide that support in finding these people employment. All right. You're on mute, Nancy. Starting it off good. I know you're you're on top of the game. I am to this morning. Um, good morning again, everyone. I'm going to talk about some duties and roles of the employment specialist. Um, as a role of an employment specialist, our, it, uh, the roles are to initiate and maintain, maintain ongoing personal contacts um, with a variety of businesses that are in your community or outside your community. Um, and job placement training agencies in order to promote programs for consumer placement. You want to make contact with those potential employers that you perceivably already know um, and the potential ones that you have on your list that you need to contact. So I would say make contact. You're going to explain the benefits and employment support services available to employers, including addressing the employer's special needs who they need in their, um, in their settings. And you also are going to help search for job leads utilizing newspapers, agencies, and other resources. Continue with this, you're gonna locate job for the consumers who are job ready, meaning these consumers are ready to go to work at any moment because you have completed everything that's been related to getting up to that point of the job ready. We may have to discuss this in more detail with the other group. Collects data from employers. So with, the, with collecting that data from employers, um, you're gonna receive job orders. You, you should be receiving job orders from them to actually pinpoint what they need from that employee, including job requirements and their skills. You're gonna match job skills with the consumer's qualifications. You're not gonna put Nancy in a, uh, in a scientific job working on rockets because she knows nothing about that. So you're gonna make sure that you um, tie in her qualities and her skills for the job that matches and what the employer needs. And you're what skills are those, Nancy? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> But Nancy's going to be very uh, in the office or she wants to work in the office as a receptionist. We'll put it like that. So we're not going to put her in this rocket science job, okay? She doesn't have those skills. So you're going to make sure you, you kind of match that up with her and the employer. You're going to refer, also refer qualified consumers to employers and conduct necessary follow-up. Please get this ingrained in your, in your forehead, in your, on your computer, on your paperwork. It's necessary to follow up when consumers are being placed in positions, whether that follow up is a month, 
um, uh, two months, four months, a year, but you're gonna make sure you follow up because consumers may, especially if you haven't closed them out and went, and went on, you shouldn't really close them out that in that time frame anyway. Follow up, follow up until they're ready, they're satisfied, you're ready, the employee's ready to move, move you out of the way. That's the best way to put it. Keep up to date on local job fairs and internet resources. And you're gonna make sure that your consumers are attending these things. Well, with COVID, they can do it online because we have job fairs online around here. So make sure that you are, are aware that maybe your uh, area, your community is having job fairs on the internet and what these resources are and where they are. Researches um, various resume software programs. There's software programs out there how to build a re resume, <clears throat> excuse me, and also how to place a resume on the web, on the internet, because it's a different format and you're gonna make sure that you have that knowledge for yourself first before you try to teach your consumer how to do that. And if you don't know, someone can assist you. I just put it like that. Um, maybe the career center or someone in your office can assist you with that. Participates in outreach and recruitment activities by coordinating and attending these job fairs yourself. So if you're going yourself, if we ever get to that point where we go out into the community to do these things again, um, you can have some consumers meet you there. Um, I did that a lot. Um, have the consumers meet me where I am. And then we would walk around and see what fits them and what they would like to do, okay? And now if you're on the internet doing that, you can have them meet you like we're doing now on, on Zoom when they have these job fairs, if it's in your area. So Tom, when, when we look at the remote experience, do any of these um, duties and roles fit? You know, a lot of them certainly would, uh, you know, except for, you know, in uh, the remote areas of Alaska, of course, um, there's not a, a road system. So um, a lot of the jobs that are available are usually either through the traditional council, um, city offices, um, the, the schools, the clinics. So there's sort of a, a limited amount of jobs. And so there's not a lot of uh, um, those kinds of things. We do have job fairs um, and um, we have made those available when we were having them in person that we could uh, provide um, airfare to clients who wanted to, to go in and, and meet um, some of the, the larger employers in our region. We have a, a big, uh, um, the Red Dog Mine is in our region, so they do a lot of in, in employment kinds of things. Um, so we, we do bring folks in, into those. Also, um, a lot of the programs in um, Alaska don't have, um, you know, someone specifically to do this job. So it usually falls more on the, um, the, the counselor or the uh, supervisor or director to, to make those contacts. Um, we also have, um, you know, and probably um, other tribes across the country have uh, tribal programs and um, we have native corporations that also provide employment um, services like resume writing and, and job search. So we always make sure that our clients are um, touching bases with uh, um, those personnel to, to, to make sure that they're getting their name out there and have their resumes cleaned up and ready to be um, posted for positions that may be outside of their village. But for the most part, not everybody in our region um, wants to relocate. They, they wanna live in their home community. So it's very limiting. So we have to do more with uh, subsistence plans and self-employment. So. And, and so um, can you, can you Maybe give us just a, a rough description that you and I talked about from remote versus rural. Well, I think um, rural connotation is more farming kinds of things and more on the, the road system. And um, I would imagine even um, there are places on reservations in 
um, other parts of the United States that also have remote areas um, that are long distances from hub communities and those kinds of things. So when we talk about um, remote in Alaska, <clears throat> it's uh, more, um, you know, we have cities like Juneau, um, Anchorage and Fairbanks, which are, are larger cities. Um, but for the most part, um, the communities are spread far and few between. You know, the, the Northwest Arctic region is the size of uh, um, Indiana um, with a population of less than 10,000 people and uh, um, 11 communities that uh, are only accessible um, by airplane most of the year, snow machines or, um, you know, um, by boat. And uh, so those kinds of things is more remote and it has different challenges. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, so the role of the VR counselor, we, uh, want to cover this you know the VR counselor works to ensure that the the VR counselor the employment specialist and the consumer all understand the disability and the impacts of that disability and how it impacts employment so one of the things with the VR counselor when I was a, when I was in that chair I always liked that part of the job because I learned about so many different disabilities and I wanted to understand what they were and then that opened up that comfort level for the consumer to start talking to me about how it impacts them personally, understanding that each each person has individualized disability impacts. So we also identify an appropriate job goal based on the consumer's capabilities, <coughs> limitation, interests, and abilities. Um, the one that I forgot to put in here is informed choice, and I don't know how I missed that one. We always have to take informed choice into consideration when developing the goals. We work with the consumer to develop their services needed to become job ready and successful in the job. So a lot of people, when they come into us, they don't even understand what limitations are. Uh, they don't understand how it impacts them. It's just the way they live. So it's part of their, their, part of their being. And we help explain what those barriers are and how to overcome them. We help arrange services and assist the consumer in securing and maintaining employment. So you can start to see where some of this stuff starts to roll together. And now we have some responsibilities of the VR counselor. Do you want to run that or do you want me to run it, Nancy? All right, let me, let me, let me handle that. All right. <laughs> VR counselor, and I'm going to piggyback a little bit on the roles of the responsibilities is that, yeah, we're, we're a VR counselor, um, but we wear many hats, as Tom stated and as Wayne stated, we wear many hats. So you may become that employment specialist, that job placement person. That's, what we're, that's our job anyway, to become that job placement person. Um, so you utilize existing information gathered during the eligibility um, determination process that is current and available from other programs and providers, particularly education officials and SSA. Now you're gonna gather this information, you're gonna document this information and it's gonna help you determine what <clears throat> the eligibility, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's gonna help you determine the eligibility. It's gonna place these or, um, materials that you've gathered to help you determine the consumer's el um, status for eligibility. Utilizes information provided by the consumer and the consumer's family, okay? Utilize the most integrated settings possible consistent with the informed choice of the consumer. And remember, we give our consumers their own choice. We don't dictate to what they need, what we think they need. We kind of put it out there. We kind of help them along the way, but we don't want to make up their minds for them. We're gonna give them the best scenarios, okay? We're not gonna say, hey, this is the best for you. We're gonna give them the best scenarios and say, this is what I found. Let's talk about it, okay? And then we're going to make sure that we interpret that they have a clear, concise understanding of um, the findings that we have found, they have found and come together and agree or not agree, not agree or, or not agree, but we're gonna come together to find and interpret these um, findings for the consumer. Excuse me, <clears throat> a little grogginess.
So um, Nancy's getting the frog taken care of. There's a couple comments about language in the um, in the chat box about how VR language is, is intimidating also. Yes. And that's part of the other, and we're gonna get into that here in a minute. Yep. yep. I speak of this a lot in, um, well, well, we'll get to a lot, but I speak a lot of class, how we talk to our consumers, bringing it down to where we can all understand and they can understand too, but we'll, we'll get that to that in a minute. <clears throat> Okay, next slide. Coordinates purchases and oversees the consumer assessment process. Assessments meaning your psych evaluation if they need one, work evaluation, the WWI evaluation, career assessment evaluation, all these assessments. <clears throat> Through skilled counseling techniques relies, excuse me, relays a need for assessment to the consumer and the list is consumer informed choice. We talk about informed choice a lot because that's what we need to talk about a lot. Informed choice of the consumer. The need for the assessments. Explain to the consumer, why are you doing this assessment? Okay, and help them to understand why. Integrates information gathered into a comprehensive rehab program. And also again, relays information in an understandable way. Again, the language, the language, the language. So some competencies <clears throat> of us as rehab counselors and rehab staff, um, vocational, excuse me, genuineness, respect, empathy, immediacy, advocacy. You need to also put in here flexibility, but that's what we need. So when, when I see advocacy, I, I kind of lump flexibility yeah, and I know. to conflict people. Yeah. Or have, not, not conflict. Confront people. Confront. I don't know where that came from. The, the, the ability to confront is a huge yeah. skill that I think um, when we hear that word, everybody thinks it's a bad situation and it's not a bad thing. It's not. It really isn't a bad thing, Wayne and others, because you, we have to know how to face those confrontations that are those things that that's going to confront. We have to confront. We, we, we confront. We're confronting now in a positive way. So if there is someone that disagrees with us, we can't stray from that. We can't push that back and say, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever. We have to walk this through, walk through the path of understanding um, and then help out excuse me, and help our co uh, consumers um, in a sensitive and in a respectful way, that word right there, that's my word right there, respect, respectful way to give them to under or to help them to understand the courage that, that advocacy. So that's why we're being that flexible because it's all in there, that flexible, flexible selves. Hmm, excuse me. That way. <laughs> Every person in your agency, we're talking about working alliance now. Every person in your agency plays a role in developing an office culture that supports an effective consumer counselor working alliance. There are three components that make up the working alliance. These, the first one are goals. Those are established and agreed upon that address the consumer's motivation in seeking rehabilitation services. You can tell if a consumer comes into your office and their people have told them, go find a job. Are they motivated? Are they doing this because? Are they doing this because they want to? Or are they because, because they were pushed to do this? So we have to and make sure that we establish the goal and agree that they are motivated um, for, to, to, to complete the rehabilitation services and also to go to work. Tasks are responsible um, of both the consumer and the counselor. So it's a collaboration. We have to be partners. That's the word I use to my consumers. We were partners um, in a collaborative manner and carried out to achieve specific goals. Again, consumer choice, consumer ready, consumer motivation, bonds. Bonds are described as the nature of the relationship and include um, different values, uh, excuse me, different levels of trust and attachment between the consumer and the counselor. 
how how have how you have built that rapport, how you have bonded with that consumer is vitally important. You have to, you must build that rapport in order to, for it successful. Now, if you have a client that comes in with all kind of this right here running and running and foul language and all that, you can you can zip that. Respectfully, you can zip that. And it may take you a couple of times. It may take him walking or her walking out the door a couple of times. Or you saying, okay, you know, we need to just table this for another day if they, you're getting really volatile or however the however your office to um that's another thing of I'm sorry, let me back up. That's another way of confrontation also. The bond that you build. What did you have to go through to build that bond? Okay. Um or they come into the office and ready, they're ready to have the pleasantries, but you're not gonna get everybody this pleasant. I just wanna put that out there. The definition of a working alliance applies to all staff who interact with consumers. Everyone in your office has a role in enhancing the quality and effectiveness of rehabilitation or services. Not just you, not just that consumer, but who that consumer confronts first or comes to first at that window when they're saying, I need to see Nancy, um, my counselor, and you just brush her off and say, well, have a seat over there. I, I, I'll see if she's in. No. <laughs> so you have to make sure you build that rapport. Again, make sure that everyone in your office staff is build up that, um, that the pleasantries. We you know our offices, our, our jobs are hard. We do a lot, but we still have to be pleasant. When could support be needed? 24 <laughs> seven. All right. During recruitment and job search, application and interview, during the hiring process, the orientation and the, the initial training. When you want to say something? Oh. Yeah, this, I mean, this is all, um, when, we, when we talk about support, we're talking about the team support, right? So. Right. And it's not just for the consumer, it's for the employer as well. When, when, when we're doing recruitment and job searching, that's, that's, we're, we're speaking to the consumer, we're supporting the consumer in their search. But at the same time, as we develop our network, our business networks, we're also supporting the employers uh, in that search. You know, you're reaching out to that, those people in the network saying, hey, what do you have open? Do you need any people? That type of thing. It's not just, it's not just one-sided. So during their initial social, thank you, Wayne, the social inclusion, um, social inclusion is a lot, is a biggie. Social inclusion, again, everyone in, your, in the environment, everyone in the community, how this person interacts with that other person or the staff people or what's going on, social inclusion. Um, this is when support can be needed. And you may have to model this, well, well, well no, no, you may not have to, you know, I'm not gonna say you may have to, you should be modeling um, social, um, uh, social aspects of um, be including this consumer in, in the, um, how to be sociable, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Social, um, social so skills, soft go skills. Ahead. Like soft skills. You know, like soft you skills, yes. Into, when you walk into a place, a potential place of employment, you know, like you said, you don't, you aren't using foul language, you're, you're dressed appropriately, you're moving forward um, in a positive way. So just that modeling of behaviors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also during the stabilization period, when, you know, when the consumer has, has been established, he's in his job or her job, and they're stabilized now, you still, support still can be needed or should be needed or could be needed, um, all the above. Um, just make sure that you have that rapport again, that, that collaboration, that partnership with that consumer, and they can call and say, you know, Nancy, um, I, I know I've been on my job for six months, but I, something's going on. So therefore you're, you're flexible again. And then that person could just probably need someone just to talk to or talk with, or they may need to find uh, some, whatever's on the jobs going on. That person can know that they can support, that you will support them, excuse me. Um, doing their performance appraisals. Wow, that's a big one. You know, they may not understand what's going on. They may not need, to, need to know what's going on with their performance. They got it on this paper and they had to have evaluate and they need you to help them. Whatever it is, you're, you're, you're supporting them. Advancement, they may want to get an advancement in their jobs. 
They may want to do whatever it takes to get that next job. Advancement could be maybe they're being promoted. Advancement means um, they need some more money or whatever it is, but you help walk them through this. You help them to understand this. This is the support that could be needed. Um, again, any time of change or problem occurs, we should be there for our consumer. We should be there. <clears throat> Can I ask a question about the change or problems? Mm -hmm. um, I have a consumer who I closed out, I guess, at, in 2019, and he has had a relapse. They want to keep him at his current job and <clears throat> sort of under a corrective program. Can I reopen him based on a letter from the employer asking for additional assistance in maintaining his employment? So we, in a situation like that, we, we would fall back to the eligibility criteria, right? So the, we, we start, because it's, it's been over two years, um, you know, with the best practices, we're looking at six months to a year for post-employment services. Um, but that also depends on, on your, your program's policies. Okay. If your policies state that you support them longer, then, then you can, you could potentially look at this as a, as a post-employment uh, service case. Okay. But if, if you don't and you have to reopen the case, then yeah, you fall back on that, that the eligibility process and you go yeah. through that because we, we provide services to obtain, maintain, or advance employment. And so this would definitely fall under that maintain employment mm -hmm. category. It would, but it doesn't mean they're automatically eligible for services, right? They may be eligible for the program, but then you'd evaluate what services are required to help them maintain. Thank you. Yep. You bet. All right. Any other questions? I guess we'll move on. All right. Guiding principles for disclosure. Okay. Describe yourself by your job qualifications. Or excuse me, let me back up. Describe yourself by job qualifications, not by disability. We're not our disability. We have our disabilities but we have job qualifications. Describe those, please. Articulate and demonstrate how you can perform the essential functions of the job. Do not volunteer negative information. People see a lot of things that, that we talk about as negative, especially when we're trying to um, um, obtain in, in, um, employment. And you know you don't wanna come off to the employer like, or the consumer doesn't wanna come off to the employer as, oh, I gotta have all this and do all this and all that, uh, yeah. You don't want them to bring the negativity out yet. Avoid medical terms or human service jargon as they can confuse and potentially scare the employer. Again, again, that language that we talked about earlier, not only to our consumers, but to our employers that they may not even understand. Emphasize current positive activity rather than dwelling on past negative experiences. Again, that negative. If possible, connect past problems with issues with significant life events. We, we all have stories, but we can connect those past problems and then make sure that they're significant to what's going on in the present, what's going on now when we're talking to our consumers. And to emphasize, that you are in, in <clears throat> emphasize that you are in charge and control. Wayne, take that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so on, on this one, what we what we're looking at is is you know we, we can manage our disabilities after we get into the acceptance and adjustment to disability. So our disabilities are manageable to a degree. And, and because it's so individualized, we have to emphasize that we're not a stigma or a stereotype. We are the ones that are controlling our management and then that we can move forward with within our abilities. And so disclosure is one of those, those tricky slopes. Um, sometimes, especially when, if you're working with some, some employer or some consumers, they want to disclose everything up front. So they want to talk about everything because they feel that that's the only way they can be honest or upfront with the employer. 
And while I support that, if that's if they feel very strongly about it, I always went back to like this list, and we would try and 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 create something for them to disclose in a positive fashion so it wasn't their disabilities or their limitations that we talked about it was their abilities and then we would talk about what they've done to overcome their barriers so they did address the barriers but they did it in a positive a supportive uh, fashion if that makes sense yeah thank you i was having you know it's here having a moment yeah <laughs> allergies <laughs> okay so creativity nancy let's get creative let's get creative think outside that box and we're doing it and you guys you're doing it because i know you come up with ways of finding employment of finding ways that you can assist your consumers you look at services that are available in your community you look at services who's doing what in your community um and you go and you and you pick up these things and you may there might have to be a job carving thing going on there may have to be a job development going on for a particular job um so yeah creativity <clears throat> so when we look at gaps in services so what's there in, in the community when, when we talk about what in this one, when I'm talking about services, I'm talking about for the employer side, what, what is the employer, where are the gaps in the employer services to the community? That's where I was looking for a lot of jobs because I could fill those gaps with our people and the skills they have. What services do not exist that the community could use. So again, um, you know, and some of that stuff, like what Tom was talking about earlier with that remote location, creating those jobs, there might be one or two employers. And on the other reservation that I've worked with, there was a couple main employers, and it was usually the tribe or the casino or something like that. And, and we had to figure out what was needed in the community. And so sometimes the job development went from job development to small business development. Uh, and I think, Tom, you mentioned a little bit about the subsistence stuff, and I think that goes along that same path. If you get into a situation and, and you see a need in the community for services that are not existent, that's an opportunity to develop potential employment. Mm -hmm. We also look at what skills, abilities, capabilities, and desires does the consumer have? And this, mm -hmm. this, is, the, this is part of that informed choice. We can't tell our consumer they're going to go to work here or there they have to participate in it. They, they get the right and they have the right to, dis, to determine what they want to do. We can't force them into a corner and tell them they're going to do this job or that job. Right. right. Um, if I can just, oh, sorry. No, I, was, I was just going to add, you know, creativity is the key and thinking outside of the box. And so some of these things can be answered in your assessments. You're doing your assessments with your consumer and trying to do that uh, job matching and job skills and those things, that's when you can kind of start thinking ahead of time and thinking outside of the box because you're gathering information during your whole time that you're assessing your consumer. You're gathering information the whole time that you are uh, connecting employers to employees. And so some of these questions can be answered in the process while you're moving forward with your consumer, because in order, we, one person cannot do everything or one agency is not going to be able to provide every service. And so you're going to look in the community, you're going to have to look into the community and say, okay, it looks like this person uh, needs some services for food stamps. And so um, maybe I can make a referral. So you want to be able to know what services are available in the community, whether it's a food bank or whether it's Department of Social Services. And so when you create, and all of that is going to be important in order, for, in order to maintain and sustain this employment and this placement. Because if I don't have adequate food supply, I'm probably not going to be able to support myself enough to go to work. Um, the gaps in the services for employers 
you know, if if you have assessed your employer and and you figured out, or the you and the employer have a relationship with the manager at McDonald's, and he says we have three cashier positions open, then you know that's a gap. That is a gap in the employer's services because they need to fill these positions. And so when we start thinking about gaps, you have to have that relationship with that employer so that you know what those gaps are. When you're talking to the consumer, you will know McDonald's have McDonald's is in need of three cashiers. For some reason, they can't keep cashiers. And so, you know, maybe there are services that do not exist, like Tom said, you know, where he is a is a very remote area. So what thinking outside of the box, you know, what is it that we need? What is it that we don't have that we could use? If it's somebody that brings in, you know, donates fuel, you know, for the for the for the planes to carry people back and forth, you know, that's something that we need. I'm, I, I'll just use that as an as a, as an example, but you know, maybe maybe you do need some food pantries. Maybe you do need to contact some churches because they've they've um, the the uh, consumer has used all their resources. And so what does not exist that you need if it's basic computer skills for your consumers? If you keep seeing that over and over and over coming through the door, then you need to create a basic skills class, a basic skills computer class. So just in, the, in your process, as you're going along, as the employment specialist, as the VR counselor, as the VR technician, these are things you need to be thinking about doing your assessment, doing your intake, whatever is going on with this consumer, you wanna be thinking about this along the way. Um, and again, I just wanna emphasize, I didn't mean to take over your slide, but um, the skills, the abilities, the capabilities and desires that the consumer has means that you can be creative. It allows you that flexibility to be creative because every, um, every, every individual is going to be different and have maybe there's a different, may, some may be the same disability, but everybody functions differently. And so once you figure out those desires and those skills, um, you can do better job matching and that starts with that job carving and job development because when you when you have a consumer that you know has certain skills and can do certain things then you know you may be able to change the job description to say well like Wayne gave us an example a few weeks ago you know with the um, hotel clerk maybe I like to do the laundry but I'm not that good at greeting customers so you might want to change that job description a little bit, which allows you that creativity based on what you know to serve this consumer. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. So person-centered planning. This is, this is the, the platform that I always used when I was working um, as, a, as a job coach or an employment specialist and, and approaching the services to the consumer and helping them develop their, their plan or, or their steps in finding employment. And some of the key elements that I, I like about person-centered planning is it, it's you're helping a person identify needs, interests, choice, desires, and dreams. And so I always did the, the lion tamer and the, and the, and the, and the um, leaf collector exercise. So what was your lion tamer job? What is your, your dream job? And then what's the leaf uh, raker job? I mean, what's the least likely thing that you'd want to do? Identifying employment options that fit well with job seekers, personal vision. So this is where we're getting really heavy into that informed choice. So we're not just telling the individual that they can go find a job or they need to find this job. We're asking them to take their personal vision of what they can do with their abilities and in addressing their limitations, what can they do in the employment field? Guiding and supporting the individual. You know, we're not the expert uh, in this situation. Uh, for me, the individual, the consumer is the expert in their abilities and their limitations. So I always ask them to bring that to the table. Uh, you know, where do you see yourself fitting in here and, and how do you see us getting there? 
engaging family, friends, and community resources. This is huge. So, especially in our communities and our culture, we you know, if you if you cut out grandma or, or uncle or auntie, you might be shooting yourself in the foot. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't get the family involved and have them supporting what you're doing. And then multicultural issues. If I, I grew up on the, in a border town, so there was always that that uh, stigma that followed me into into the white community. And then when I'd go back to the res, um, I was a wannabe white kid coming to the reservation because I was going to school in, in the white community. So it was it was that multicultural component is is very real still, and it's and it's really felt in the employment setting. So this is kind of what we wanted to get to is some of the job search strategies. Up at this point, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, so Nancy, I know uh, you got to get ready for your, your class. Yes. So we're gonna let you uh, say goodbye and then I'll keep moving forward. All right. Nice seeing everyone. Um, I appreciate you listening, and hopefully, I've, I've given you a little bit of, a little bit more to put under your, um, under your hat, in your tools. Um, and uh, I'll see you again. So I'm sure I will. Um, <clears throat> so I gotta go. Gotta vacate the premises. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll see you again. And Wayne, Tamara, thank you very much. Tom, nice seeing you again. Jamie, thank nice you. seeing you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, so job search strategies. Um, some of the things to look for is what's your job market in your community? Economics of the service area, unemployment rates, who's the primary employers, where are the jobs in your communities? Um, how are they advertised or posted? Where do you know where to go to look to find if there's any jobs? Have you checked in with your um, tribal employment offices, family business opportunities, uh, WIOA offices that are local? And then, you know, some of the processes for finding those jobs. You need time and focus and determination. And this is, this, these are some of the key points that we have to work on with our consumers because they struggle with being able to maintain that focus or, or experiencing uh, any success in, in, in committing to something like that is, is sometimes the, just the first step. Let them experience some success. What skills and aptitudes do you bring? information, support systems. You know, there's several different methods, face-to-face, -face, soft skills, communication, um, especially with some of our, our younger generation when, when they're starting to communicate, they, they lack some of those so, uh, soft skills uh, that allow them to be successful in interviewing or interacting with an employer. And that brings up the last one, that's working on interviewing skills. All right, Ms. Tamra. So during this pandemic, yeah, thank you. During this pandemic, um, you know, we've had to again be creative and think outside of the box. And so, a lot of agencies and services have gone virtual for uh, people to be able to get online and still be able to function and have their needs met uh, as far as employment and training. And so, the state, um, each. Each state has an office that's available for employment and training and workforce development, and these services are available online. So um, a lot of times the state office is going to be a career center that can help with job search strategies, and it's free of charge. And so I just want to talk a little bit about some of the tools that you can use that, that are online that does not require you to have to go into a, a, a career center or an office. So those are some, uh, um, some um, tools such as basic computer skills and referrals. You can go online. Um, there are tools in the tool that the career centers usually have what they call a toolbox. And so if, you're, if, you, if your computer skills are not that great and you need help or you need assistance in learning how to operate the system, how to go in and how to get out, how to apply for a job online, that career center is going to have that information. It may be a tutorial. It may be a webinar. 
you may be able to call and talk to someone and get a referral. If they don't offer it at that center or can't tell you, but most of the time they're gonna be able to tell you how to get that service. Again, these are online services. You also have the options for career assessments and guidance. Mm -hmm. There's a tool, there's, of course, you, you already know that there are tools that, there's different tools that can be used, and we're gonna talk about that in just a few, that can be used for assessments that are, are, that are online, but there's also in your career center, career assessments that are online that will walk this person through a series of career questions. What do you like most and what do you like least? And then it generates a, a computer printout that will tell you where your strengths and weaknesses are, the jobs that you would be good at. And so that's a really good tool to use if someone is at home and cannot get to the office. It's online too. Computer and internet access. Um, of course, there may be, so if you uh, log into your career center and you say, well, I need to know what's closest to me where I can access a computer and the internet, there'll be a list of resources. If that career center doesn't office, offer it, it's going to tell me where I can go to get it. So resume and cover letter preparation, um, job market information, job search assistance, job fair and workshop information, training and educational programs, interviewing practice and preparation, and help registering and using those workforce services online. So those are some virtual tools that can be used online. They don't have to go into the office if they can't get there. They can still have access to these um, services. This is one of the virtual tools uh, in addition to what I just told you, and I have included a, a, a website page that you can see. So if, you're, if you have a consumer and maybe you don't have enough of an assessment and you want more, this one, my next move, it's, it's discover your ideal career path. Sometimes we think we know what we want or we, 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 we may not be in the right, um, we may not know how to match our skills to the job that we want. We need an additional assessment. So my next move um, helps you discover that career path and um, helps you know what you need in order to, to, to match your skills to that career path. So for this one, <clears throat> the question is, what do you wanna do for a living? Search careers with keywords, browse careers by industry. Tell us what you would like to do. This is a good resource. If you're at home, you can't get to the office, you can go here, do assessments, find out what it's gonna take for me to have that career. How do I become a CNA, a certified nursing assistant? And it's gonna give you all that information that you need for that career. The next tool is my skills, my future. Again, identify occupations that best align with the skills and knowledge that you already have. This is a resource and this is the website page, My Skills, My Future. You go in, you tell this, tell us a job that you've had, we'll find careers with similar skills, pick a career and explore. So there's a plethora of information in these virtual tools that can be used if a person cannot get to your office. I wanna just uh, say in addition to all of that, um, there are accommodations across the state for people who have disabilities. If you have a visual uh, impairment uh, and you need something for this computer screen to be able to um, um, help you with being able to see what you need to see on the screen, there are tools in the Career Center that can change that screen so that you can, that will help you see it better. Same thing with hearing impairment. You can, um, there are tools that the Career Center will accommodate you with for hearing impaired, um, wheelchair accessibility. So there are different accommodations that the Career Center will have so that you can use these services online or in the office. You want me to keep going? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. 
choosing the right method for your consumer. So the methods used to explore the careers will vary depending on the needs and ability of the individual. So when you're doing your assessments, if you are sitting there with a consumer who already has, maybe they, maybe they have their a CNA license, maybe they are already a certified um, nurse, a certified nursing assistant, and they want to um, build on that. So it, you already know that up front so that you'll be able to choose the right method that this individual would need in order to use those tools and those services. So select methods that are appropriate to the individual. We know she's a CNA, we know she wants to become a nurse. So let's start building from this point to this point in order to become a nurse. Um, again, if it's someone with limited interpersonal communication skills and abilities, then you already know they may not perform well in an informational interview, but might do better in a situational assessment. So choosing the right method that meets the criteria for your consumer is very important. So you wanna choose methods that gets quick results so that you can get started with the job search. Methods such as if I need to take a class or do volunteer work to help me learn and train as I need to, then I need to know that quick and upfront so that we can make that happen. If there is, a, is, if there is an impairment I need to know that so that we can get accommodations for you so that we make sure we're choosing the right methods. So do not let excessive career exploration become an excuse for not moving ahead with job development. So the purpose is to gather enough information to move forward with the job search and not spend too much time researching and exploring jobs and careers. Again, when you're doing your assessment and you see that there's three or four good skills that this person have, you want to take those skills and apply it accordingly. Let's build on this. If you've been a taxi driver and now you want to become a truck driver, okay, let's build on that. The right method will help you determine which way to direct your consumer. So in working with um, a lot of the programs, this is one of the, this last one is one I see that happens a lot. We have consumers that maybe aren't sure of themselves or, or haven't had a lot of experience in, in developing these types of positions or jobs at all, doing any job searching. And they'll sp we'll, we'll spend a lot of time in this exploration moment. And, and so we think, okay, we're almost there, we're almost there, and then they'll switch right at the end. And then we'll go and we'll search that one up. And then they'll say, nope, and they'll switch, you know, they keep job goal hopping, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's where we really have to step back and look at, is this individual job ready? Maybe we have to start over and start that approach all over again of making sure that individual's job ready. And we've allowed them to have the information of the informed choice or to make the informed choice on their vocational goal. So this, this one's really important that, that don't get stuck searching. Don't mm -hmm. get, you know, you know, that happens a lot. You want to talk about labor market, or do you want me to? Uh, either or. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> well, since it's on the reservation, I would prefer you talk about yeah. the reservation piece of it. So, when you talk about labor market analysis, it's not necessarily the one where we go into the the, the employment setting and do the entire workup. We don't. We aren't. We aren't there to to look at the skills of each position. But the overall labor market analysis, what does it look like on your reservation? What does it look like in your service area? How many employers are there uh, to, pro to provide this service? Or I mean, to, to provide employment opportunities. And then we go back to that creativity of, of the job exploration or job search, and that's what services are needed. How, what gaps can we fill? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then we look at, does the market fit into consumer choice and options? Is mm -hmm. their informed choice? Does it fit their wants, their desires, their needs? Mm -hmm. How is the IPE shaped to take the labor market into consideration? So when, when we start developing the individual plan, individualized plan for employment, we have one of the one of the criteria is making sure that the vocational goal is appropriate and obtainable in that service area. 
Um, and, and so we want to build off of that when we start the job searching. So we go back to the IPE, look at the work that's been done. If you're a VR counselor and you're referring the case to an employment specialist, you want to ensure that that, that information is passed on. How is the IP, IPE connected to that labor market? Mm -hmm. Okay, so career exploration. <clears throat> there's, there's several different um, types of career exploration, but the general principle of career exploration is, is if somebody has a disability or little or no work experience or is considering a, a, a career change, there are several ways to explore new career paths. We can do research in companies, we can learn, you know, and, and learning about careers in the area, attend informational interviews to meet people. Um, this one, I, I don't use a whole lot because if I, a lot of my consumers found it really confusing. And, and so when we try and support that, it, it created a, a kind of a little hiccup in the flow. So, but there is, there is that opportunity for people to go out and talk to employers, um, job shadowing, scheduling a job tryout. Uh, that's the work experience or trial work experience. Maybe considering an internship or volunteering to gain more experience. I've, I've had a lot of um, uh, youth transitioning out of high school into the workforce that we did a lot of that um, volunteering to gain that work, work experience mm -hmm. in, in the last um, couple semesters of, of high school. Exploring these new careers help, can help a person develop a network and gather job leads. So as they're doing this career exploration, make sure that you're asking them to document who they're reaching out to, who the contacts are, because when we get to the development part, then we can go back to those people and say, you know, you, I don't know if you remember this person, but they called and chatted with you. You gave us some information. So we've kind of started to develop this, this business network um, for, the, for the consumer. Um, so in these types of career exploration, all, some of the things I talked about, these just break it down more in depth. Um, I'm not going to read it verbatim because you guys will get a copy of this, this uh, PowerPoint, but I'm going to give you just the highlights of it. Informational interviewing, it's not a job interview. You're going in and you're asking an employer questions. You're asking about what they do there, what the job positions have. You get a description of what's required for the, the position. Uh, community exploration, again, this is you go out into the community and you just maybe you drive around with, your, with them or or they drive around and they just look at the businesses that are there and they make a list of businesses and then they find out what that business is, is doing. Mm -hmm. And, and if, it, if it piques their interest, that's another option for them to go. Then they can do an informational interview if they, if they so choose. Um, Jamie, you just put in the, in the chat box that you can also conduct an informational interview with a person who does the job you're interested in doing. Ask some questions, sorry, range, yeah. So if you if if the consumer comes in and they and they have a specific job in mind, you can have them reach out to people in that same job and ask those questions. I did that a lot with youth. They would come in and want to be, you know, a um, mechanic. So okay, go talk to the local mechanic, see what they do in a day, that type of thing. Job shadowing. This. This one gets tricky because a lot of employers are really nervous about letting somebody that's not employed, uh, therefore not insured or covered by their insurance to come in and work with people. Uh, there's ways around it. So you can, it's a good way for them to learn the, the tasks and the duties associated with that job. Job tours, uh, again, they're similar to informational interviewing, but they just kind of go through the work setting. They get to see people actually doing the job and they get to see a little bit of their work environment. Company research, again, find an employer, find out what they do, what they make, where they come from, what the, what the environment's like. Labor market research, we just talked about that, uh, research in local businesses and community and economy <clears throat> to get a handle on the available jobs, looking at growth, uh, what industries are there, what's coming in, what needs to come in, that type of thing. And Tamara, I'm gonna let you talk about one-stop centers. Okay. Um... I also want to add to what Wayne said a minute ago. 
since the COVID-19 has changed our systems and we're doing a lot of things virtual, there are also those online tools that instead of job shadowing, if you wanna um, go to one of the career sites and it may be, I think ONET will allow you to click on a career choice and it will actually show a short video of following a CNA or following a CDL driver or following, you know, someone that you, your consumer may be interested in. So that's just another tool. Um, the one-stop career centers are great. Uh, they are publicly funded facilities. Um, they are located in each state. I think I said that before, every state has a career center. Um, again, understanding the locations and where your center is may be what's important to your, um, your tri tribal nation. Um, taking a class, don't forget if you are, have assessed your consumer and they don't have the skills that they need to do whatever it is that they're, they're interested in, you can always send them the training. That's again, that's one of the things that the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act does is assist uh, financially with paying for that training. And also they can support you in matching that consumer with the job after they have trained. So always remember taking a class is a good thing. CDL license is a very short time period for a person that, so let's just say they lost their job they're coming to see you. They do have a disability, but it doesn't limit them from driving. And they need a job and they need it now. If they have the skills, the interest, and the ability to go through that truck driving class for two weeks or three weeks, uh, Workforce, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act will provide the funding, then get them that training. That's a quick training. That's a job. And it is a, it is a, um, as far as the labor market is concerned, it's one of the top jobs on the list of the future jobs. Um, a situational assessment uh, involves trying out a job in the community for a few hours to a few days. Again, that's sort of like volunteering. And it's just to see if I truly, do I really wanna do this? You know, you might say you wanna be a CNA, but, um, you know, it requires more than you may think. So going to just visit the uh, facility, you know, may be an assessment that you can use to determine whether this person wants to go further with that career. Tom, so in, in hearing a lot of these um, types of career exploration, is there any specific to what you've done that you've used that worked well? Well, you know, Using the situational assessment, of course, is always a, you know, a good tool. Looking at also the, uh, um, <clears throat> labor market assessments and analysis, you know, is a real good idea because then you can have the um, client see what jobs are available in their local community and what the, um, you know, requirements are, what the salary ranges are, and if that's something that they would, you know, meets their, um, you know, skill set and those kinds of things and interest levels. Um, you know, we certainly use those kinds of things. We also, um, we um, had a one-stop center in the hub community for a period of time, but it was closed down about two years ago. So, um, unfortunately, the state Department of Voc Rehab had very little presence in the Northwest Arctic region of Alaska. You know, they, they just they just weren't there. Um, so, you know, it's kind of encouraging to hear that a lot of these services are now available online um, mm -hmm. and can be utilized um, because um, it just it was just non-existent for our region for um, forever. You know, we mm -hmm. would get a a VR state VR counselor um, in our region, maybe once every five years, <laughs> you know, for, you know, they fly in. And if you happen to live in one of the uh, um, outlying villages outside of Kotzebue and, um, you know, the caribou were migrating to your community and you needed to hunt that 
particular day, then you missed out on the, the state VR. Um, so, and they never came out to the, um, the villages and didn't provide funding to come in. A lot of times we would, uh, um, if we knew in advance they were coming in, we would fly some of the uh, consumers in to do that. But um, we also utilized uh, um, the WOWIE assessment, which was, was also a, a great tool. Um, um, so I guess that's about it. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. It's, it's always... <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, I have a question for Tom. Do, do you think the assessments that you're using gives you the information that you need to make decisions or to help the consumer make decisions? Well, you know, um, given the limited amount of jobs that we have in our community, um, mm -hmm. there's also very few open jobs in the community. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that's um, also has to be taken into consideration. So that's why the labor market analysis is good. It's also good to look at the different kinds of um, gaps in, the, in services um, in the community and looking for, especially if you're looking for um, someone who's working on a um, subsistence um, IPE and you're looking at how to make that sustainable if uh, your particular client is gathering um, wood to make a drying rack, um, they also might be able to um, get additional wood to, um, for drying racks, sort of a, yes, um, a yes. kit kind of thing that they can sell to other people in the community. If the, um, as part of their IPE, you're looking at buying some tools for like uh, after they're harvesting meat, um, if they need a, a bandsaw to cut meat, is there mm -hmm. some way that they can um, provide that additional yes. service for other people in their community um, to, to cut meat for them? If they're building a, a drying um, shed, um, can they rent part of that space out for other people to dry their fish and dry their meat? Um, so we look at those kinds of things to look at sustainability. Um, if they're building a smoker, um, you know, when they're done smoking their fish or their meat, um, they can also provide that service to other people in the community who might not have that skill or the space to do it, or if they're elders or th something like that. So that's how we look at those kinds of things. All right, so Thank we're done. You. Yeah, Thank 10, you. Minutes, so. Um, we're getting a lot of good information. I see there's a lot of stuff happening in the in the chat box too. There's a lot of links being put up there for people to look at. Great. All right. So employment development tools. Um, when we start looking at, at this, there are many different tools available. There's no cookie cutter service or tool that will fix it for everybody or be used for everybody. So again, we have to make sure we individualize that tool and that approach. Um, some of the ones that that we see on on that is utilized a lot are like transferable work skills list. Uh -huh. What does that person bring in? How does that per, you know what what does that person present with? And and then how do can we use those skills in a new employment setting that allows them to manage their disability needs? Exactly. The interest inventory, again, that's another informed choice thing. Um, it, it gives us an idea of what they're interested in. And the one I like because it challenges um, a lot of people, especially at the beginning stages of their, of their acceptance to disability or adjustment to their disability, is their abilities list. When we start listing all the positive stuff, there's, there's a lot of people out there that don't look at their disability in that fashion. They only focus on what they can't do or what they're struggling with. And that is the next list, right? The limitation need. What, what do you need? What, what needs are there that limit your ability to, to obtain or maintain your employment or advance that? And then you've heard me talk about the dream, dream job versus nightmare job already. And you want to add anything to that, Tamara? Um, no, that was well said. So a couple of the resources that we have <coughs> that we use online a lot is the 
the um, Jan or Java Accommodations Network. Jan is is I I I, I really enjoy Jan because it gives you an idea of accommodations, but it also has a really good list of of what areas are impacted by certain disabilities. Onet, we've talked a lot about Onet online and um, what 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 is dis described there, but another one that we um, use is Workforce Innovation Technical Assistance Center, wintac.org. There's a great set of tools there. And while WinTAC isn't being um, continued at this point, it is still, it's still available for resources and use um, at this current time. Tamara, you have anything to add to that? I do not. Sorry about that. Um, gaps can be work, gaps in work history. This is a, um, a significant issue, especially when we have people with disabilities or uh, I see this a lot with um, individuals who have uh, uh, some criminal background. Uh, they'll maybe they get put in prison for a while or uh, something happens. We see those gaps. So how do we address that? Well, we can change the resume style. We go from uh, chronological uh, to experience-based so that we can take some of those time gaps out of there and base it on um, the, the experience that they bring to it. Explaining the gap in a resume or cover letter, uh, stay-at-home mom, primary caregiver for a family member, uh, you know, whatever that happens. And then another thing you can do is utilize the experiences of the gap for employment experiences. Now this, this one, um, is a unique one uh, and it's actually from a, a previous case that I uh, helped this individual on and the individual presented she was a she'd been incarcerated for a long time she'd been a drug runner since she was 14 years old and so as we started talking about some of the skills that she presented with the drug running you know weights and measurements um, incredible people skills you know she had managed people's emotional uh, situations she's you know always in a high stress situation chaos uh because she people were trying to steal her drugs when she was dropping off to her customers so she she learned how to manage these people really well and and looking at the the skill set that she presented with this we we were able to develop the resume to, and, and turn it into a, a positive approach we got her employed at a tortilla factory and she was a quality uh, specialist person or quality control person. She could look at a stack of tortillas and tell you just by looking at them if there's two or three tortillas off on the count. It was, it was really incredible to watch her work. And that's just a, a brief example of, of how you can utilize some of those experiences and un, you know, unconditional or not unconditional, un, I don't know, I just lost the word. Those non-traditional. Yeah, non thank you. Traditional non-traditional uh, skill sets in mm -hmm. finding people employment. Okay. So do you want to um, take this one, Tamara? Yes, this is just, you know, as, as, as an employment specialist, you just want to have different ideas or ways of contacting employers. Send a, you can send a letter of inquiry with the resume, make a phone call as an advocate for your consumer. A lot of employers don't like walk-ins, but some do. And just make sure you follow up. And if you want to discuss what methods some people use, Wayne, that's up to you, what methods some people are using. Or if you want to put it in the chat box, you yeah. know, Methods are you using now for your area to reach out to employers to let them know that you're interested or you have a consumer that's interested? How do you how do you how do you communicate with your employers now?
Yeah, so yeah, put it, if people want to unmute their, their Zoom and tell us, that's great, or you can put it in the chat, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll watch the chat box. Now he's posted a question in the chat box as well. We're going to keep moving forward here. Business relationships. All right, Cameron. Get to know your employers. Determine what they need. Um, emphasize their services and benefits. Uh, promote services as a source of reliable workers. Um, employers like it when you're interested in what they're doing and what they need. So if you can build that rapport with them, you know, they're more likely to call you when they have an opening and, you know, you can, you let them know what skills and abilities your consumer has to meet their service needs, identifying products and services in your community. Again, this is building rapport, being interested in the businesses in your community because you want to be able to have them as your, your um, primary resource to job placement. Finding the decision maker in the agents, in the employment, in the employer. <clears throat> Looking at your network for referrals. Again, the Career Center um, keeps a database of employers who are looking for people to employ. Um, talk to your agents, talk, <clears throat> excuse me, talk to your agency's supplier, start an employer advisory committee. That is what that is key and it really, really works. And I've seen it work when you can um, have your employment specialist to create a committee that meets maybe once a month with the employers in the community because you gather information, you find out in one setting some of the needs that is, that's in the community, what are employers saying, what you're saying and what you have to offer it really, really works for a good networking tool. Requesting a tour of local companies, that's the place where in, in, in your meetings where you can get those things arranged. You can get those things set up. Maybe you've got two consumers that might be interested in the same employer. You can do it all in one day. So surveying employers about labor needs, again, what, what is it that they need? If you know, if you can uh, contact your economic development uh, person in your community and you find out about new employers that's coming, maybe they're building an olive garden in, in, in somewhere and they're going to need 30 employees. You need to know that. You need to know that. Um, you can also assist with offering training to local businesses. You can guide them and, and show them the resources that's in the community for them to be able to list their jobs and participating in community functions. When those job fairs are going on, you need to be there. All right, so some supporting information for employers. Um, you know, the participation with AVIC programs, they can help employers to uh, serve more customers or improve their services, uh, increase efficient use of resources of their time and staff. So this, this really gets more into the into some of the carving job carving component. Uh, you know, you present some of these ideas, and it helps the employer understand they can save money, maybe increase their earnings, uh, improve workflow, so you get some productivity that increases. You get uh, you can limit some of the employees that are getting bogged down with important yet non essential tasks. So if you have somebody that's doing um, a specific job task, but they have to take care of five other steps uh, in order to complete the day. If you can bring in somebody to complete those five steps and have that one person just focus on their job uh, task, you can improve that uh, person's productivity. We leave core staff who struggle to manage their workloads. Again, um, we all know that people are getting overwhelmed and overloaded in the current work situations. It increases customer satisfaction, which then in turns, you know, in turn increases um, income. It, you can get more flexibility in the workplace through carving some of these positions and supporting. And then the seasonal fluctuation. So if you've got seasonal type work, um, developing these relationships can help those employers manage that, that fluctuation a lot easier. And as we get going into um, working with, with uh, job development and placement, there's just some general questions. And what should a consumer know? 
Well, they need to know themselves, uh, their interests, strengths, areas for improvement, what type of job relates to their interests. If there's no available jobs in the area, who to ask for help, um, where jobs are listed. You know, again, where are they, where are they advertised? Are they put up at the post office? Are they put up at the local gas station? Do you have a local paper? Um, where do you identify your employers? Where can you find this information? Where do you go? Those are just some things that you can answer. And then questions to ask employers, are credentials required for this position or in this field? What is a typical entry level salary or wage? And is there upward mobility? These are just some general questions that you can utilize when you start engaging in that placement process. So the conclusion, employment opportunities in rural remote areas such as reservations depend highly on collaboration between the counselor, the consumer and the community. Mm -hmm. We have to work as a team. And, you know, as Tamara mentioned earlier, um, there's the, this, uh, when I was a state VR counselor, we had a group of people and we didn't call them an advisory committee, but we'd have a group of employers come in and we just have a round table and they would have discussions about who was hiring, what was becoming available. And as a, as a VR counselor and as an employment specialist, it was important for me to sit at that table and hear those, those uh, connections. Employment depends on the creativity of the consumer counselor and community. So again, the creativity, thinking out of the box, what needs need to be met, what aren't, what services aren't available that we need to have in our um, communities. Self-employment subsistence should be more carefully considered as a VR employment outcome. A lot of times we get stuck where we don't like to talk about self-employment or subsistence living in some cases, because it, it Maybe we don't understand it. Maybe we don't fully grasp the impact or, or know how to develop it in our communities, but it's something that we need to look at. Use several different methods. There's not a, a, a one right way. It takes several different approaches to make it successful. Face-to-face mm -hmm. -face when we can. I mean, that's still one of the number one ways of getting people jobs. However, in these, in these times now, maybe Zoom is your face-to-face -face or some other, uh, virtual platform. Work on interviewing techniques. So many times we, we forget about soft skills and, and that's very important. When we're sitting with an employer, we wanna present the best that we can. If you get no job offering, be willing to take a temporary position. So sometimes that's the, that's the opening door, that part-time position. Remember, as long as it's a permanent position, that's all we, that's what we can count as successful employment, permanent part-time position, permanent seasonal position, permanent full-time position. Those are all acceptable, um, successful outcomes. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're one minute over, so I'll talk really fast. <laughs> we got the next talking circle is on um, March 17th. It's going to be over the mental health series. And then this PowerPoint or this webinar. Uh, then the next webinar is going to be on assistive technology, and that'll be March 31st. So please join us. Um, here is the link to the survey. John, will you throw that in the box, please? You just did. Awesome. Way to read my mind. Or you, maybe you've done this a time or two. Please take the survey. Um, it helps us direct where we're going in the next training sessions or technical assistance sessions and gives us topics to, to discuss. And yes, we will be emailing this out in our weekly update on Friday. We'll have a link there so you can watch this recording and see the, the material. Any questions, comments, concerns? If there is, here's how you can contact us. We are on Facebook. Winona is the one that's managing our Facebook for us. She's she's great with it. So I just want to thank everybody for coming today. I hope there's some good information. I see the chat box is lighting up. This is awesome. Great. Thank you, Tom, for your support and camera. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Welcome.
All right, you guys have a great day. And again, if, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us and, and everybody stay safe and enjoy um, in some areas, the warmer weather. I don't know about everywhere. Yep. We're gonna be today. Yeah, go ahead. Are you still recruiting programs for another round of your employment and development and placement series? No, not right now. We're, we're oh. full. Okay. And we're hoping to have that out, um, you know, by August, we'll hopefully have all the training modules available.